Happy Thursday, everyone, and welcome to Something to Talk About Live. My name is Jamie Hinkle. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Learning and Inclusion Manager at PFLAG National. Uh, just like every week, I'm going to be the staff person representing you all in the chat or the comments or wherever you're joining us from. So if you have any questions for our guests, please let me know. Um, and again, just like always, I'm going to bring in Jean Marie Nevetta, who's going to lead today's conversation. Hey, Jamie Hankel, we're united again. We are, we are. And I was just telling you this, the sky in my, my neighborhood is this weird color. I think it's called blue. It's uh, very strange. We're not used to it in Portland. Uh, well, here in Southern California, we are enjoying it most of the time, but I congratulate you on seeing the sun. Yes, that's wonderful. Well, I will see you soon and uh, enjoy. Thank you, Jamie. Hey, everybody. My name is Jean Marie Nevada. My pronouns are she and ella, if you speak Spanish. Um, and I'm the Director of Learning and Inclusion at PFLAG National. Every single week we get together to talk about something related to inclusion for everybody, but especially for our LGBTQ friends and loved ones. Um, and this week we are having a really interesting and important conversation on autism and queer people who are also autistic. So if you're following us online and you're reading the article, you can pick up this week's article by visiting straightforequality.org slash discussion series. Um, the article that we're using this week is from Psychology Today. It was written by Dr. Robert Muller, and it was called Why Identifying as Queer Can Be Harder for Those with Autism. And the article outlines a number of really interesting points, and um, the article itself actually got us talking at PFLAG, which is part of what led to this conversation. So to for today's discussion, um, I am always joined by people who are much smarter and more interesting than I am, and this week is no exception. We have two guests, and let me tell you a little bit about them before we bring them in. We are going to be joined by uh, Lydia XZ Brown, who is a writer, public speaker, trainer, consultant, activist, advocate, community organizer, community builder, scholar, and on top of it all, an attorney. Uh, they found and lead the Fund for Community uh, Reparations for Autistic People of Color's Interdependence, Survival, and Empowerment in partnership with the Autistic Women and Nonbinary Network. We are also about to be joined by Kaylee Whalen, and Kaylee is an advocate and a communications professional who, as an autistic transgender Latinx woman, um, is building connections across social justice movements. She's led some of the biggest digital campaigns for disability justice, transgender and queer justice, environmental justice, humanist values, and peace building. And Kaylee is also um, a member of the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. So enough about them. I want to start asking them questions. So let me bring in Lydia and Kaylee. Hello and welcome. I'm so glad to have you both here, um, and I'm really excited to have this conversation. Um, and the place that I actually wanted to start with both of you in this conversation was one that came up while we were preparing for this show. So every single week as we're getting ready for the next week's show, we go diving through the news to find a really good current events article about what we want to talk about. And interestingly enough, um, we went searching this week, and we again, we're looking sort of in more mainstream um, news. What we discovered was that the article that we landed on was a year old and that we were not finding a lot of newer articles that were appearing about the topics of both um, people who are uh, uh, queer as well as autistic. So I want to ask you both, and Lydia, maybe we can start with you. Why do you think there is such a lack of coverage and such a lack of visibility going on in a conversation that really does need to be bigger? Mainstream media coverage always assumes a very inaccurate and flawed assumption that when we talk about marginalized people, we only mean the most privileged people in any marginalized community. That if we're talking about people who are queer or trans, that we mean white queer people, white trans people. We mean non-disabled trans people, non-disabled queer people. We mean queer and trans people who speak English and live in the global north and who hold other experiences of privilege even as they move through the world as part of the LGBTQ community. And similarly, we think the same thing about disability. The assumption is if we're talking about disability, we mean the most privileged disabled people, white disabled people, straight disabled people, disabled men, cis disabled people, Etc. And so it's not surprising that mainstream media coverage will replicate those assumptions, will further those assumptions, and then will influence how most of us think to begin with. 
even within our communities, we tend to make that default assumption unless we're actively pushing against it. That if we talk about disability, we mean privileged disabled people. If we talk about LGBTQ people, we mean the most privileged LGBTQ people. And it doesn't help that because of the impact of compounded marginalization, people who are marginalized in more than one way are that much less likely to be afforded the same opportunities, to have the same platform, to be able to gain the same visibility, and therefore to be able to be witnessed as representing our communities and doing work that is on par with work done by people who have access to a bigger platform and to more privilege. I think that is such a good lens. And I really appreciate it because I have to say my own experience in this space the conversation is happening and it's happening really frequently. It was shocking to see how it didn't actually sort of make it out of, you know, I guess the spaces where we've initiated it. Um, Kaylee, how would you like to build on that? What's your perception? I mean, you work in communication. This is your thing. Why, why do you think this is happening? Um, so we have a lot of people talk about like a lost generation of autistic people and a lost generation of transgender people that that often we're only finding our voices uh, being represented as autistic uh, people, uh, a full you know generation um, after you know autism was and neurodiversity was highly stigmatized, and you saw um, you know a lot of people who didn't fit the traditional mold of the original autism criteria, which was based on studying white boys from affluent parents who were generally the sons of scientists and literally who's who in America. Um, if you didn't fit that model, you weren't diagnosed. Uh, and yet the um, growth of the community recently has meant that we have a lot of people who as adults are realizing they're autistic who weren't, you know, autism wasn't in the DSM till 1980. Transgender is being more recently understood. Um, and each DSM has changed the definitions. And what we're seeing is awareness and autistic people and transgender people advocating for their rights and getting a stage from a lot of fighting, from a lot of direct action, from a lot of demanding that they be heard because the money still goes to organizations that aren't led by autistic and neurodivergent people and LGBT organizations who I was part of this fight for a long time, largely weren't representing trans people and the most marginalized uh, people of color, autistic people. So you had, um, I mean, everyone can name the name Autism Speaks as an organization that never spoke by and for autistic people. That's why we have organizations like Autistic Women and Nonbinary Network. And I was working at the, um, National uh, Gay and Lesbian Task Force as they tried to change their brand and take on a whole disability justice component and change to the National LGBTQ Task Force, take on transgender and disability leadership. And in the last couple of years, you've seen um, well, pretty much all the major LGBTQ organizations uh, now have people of color and marginalized LGBT people in leadership roles when that wasn't previously the case. So you're seeing a big shift um, in who is leading organizations and organizations that have been founded in the last decade or so. Um, there's a siren outside the window, sorry. Um, so when we talk about communications specifically, we have messages amplified in the media that portray autism as something sad, as something to be cured, as something that uh, there's also this language of like autism kidnapped my child or like autism took the real child I had away. And it is similarly like, oh, with trans people, oh, the daughter I thought I had or the son I thought I had, you know. And this is really harmful language that trans and autistic and neurodivergent people are pushing back against because we're whole people and we communicate that like, you're not losing a daughter, you're not losing your, your child. Your child was always there. You just weren't recognizing who they were as a full person. And, you know, um, I mentioned, uh, we can bring it up later, but we have a book 
that the Autistic Women Non-Binary Network put out called Sincerely, Your Autistic Child. Um, what? Uh, uh, it's called Sincerely, Your Autistic Child. And it's um, by Beacon Press. And it's by non-binary and uh, women, including trans women. The full title is What People on the Autism Spectrum Wish Their Parents Knew About Growing Up, Acceptance, and Identity. And this book has really changed um, in just in the last year. It's, it's literally 361 days old. <laughs> um, we're celebrating the anniversary in, in, uh, in just a few days. Um, so, you know, we're very close to um, just marking a year on a, on a book like this when for generations we've not had trans and non-binary autistic adults talking about their experiences growing up and getting published. Um, I, I really appreciate that. And actually, I was I was looking at the book as I was getting ready for this, and I thought this is definitely different than a lot of the other resources that I have seen, which I thought was really interesting. You actually raised something, and I would like to ask you both about it, if, if it would be okay. And that actually is the diagnosis process, because I know a, a number mm. of people who are in the process of going through this. Um, are there any specific hurdles that you both see maybe um, in the process that um, are specific to trans and non-binary folks when it comes to getting their diagnosis? One unfortunately common phenomenon is disbelieving autistic people specifically about our genders and sexualities. And it comes from what we call the presumption of incompetence. That phrase has been used for decades. It came out of the self-advocacy movement of people with intellectual disabilities to refer to the widespread belief that people with disabilities, and especially people with disabilities that affect how we think and how we learn, are not capable of making decisions for ourselves, of understanding our own lives, of being in charge of our own lives, or even of just knowing who we are. And, you know, I encountered this rhetoric, for example, when I was in the UK giving a talk, and someone in the audience stood up and said, you know, I'm the mother of a girl on the autism spectrum who recently told me that she would prefer to be called they, them pronouns and that she's not actually a girl. And I really just think that people are taking advantage of kids like my daughter who don't necessarily have the knowledge to reject ideas about gender and maybe are just afraid of what it means to be a woman and that that's what's happening, that all these children with autism are being told that they're transgender. Now, this person was obviously a turf, right? And yeah. I was, you know, standing there like, oh. first of all, the person you're describing is not your daughter, they're your child. And secondly, um, you know, autistic people, just like non-autistic people, are able to know who we are and also question who we are. Right. Plenty of non-disabled trans people and non-disabled queer people go through a period of self-discovery, maybe multiple periods of self-discovery of figuring out who am I? Right. Who do I love? How do I love? How do I express myself? How do I understand who I am? And, but the difference is that because of the presumption of incompetence, when disabled people question our identities, or even when we state very clearly, I am this, it is really easy for other people in our lives to dismiss that as you don't really know that. That's just your autism talking. And there have been cases that many of us have talked about before where folks have actually been told you can't access gender confirmation surgeries or other gender affirming treatments, surgical or non-surgical, unless you control your mental illness or unless you find a cure for your autism or you can prove that you're in recovery from that thing you have. Because otherwise, we don't trust that you're making an informed conscious decision that is unaffected or uninfluenced by your mental disability. And again, it's the presumption of incompetence. If a non-disabled person says, I'm trying to figure out my sexuality, most of us, not the far regressive right, but most of us would say, okay, that's fair. You're trying to figure it out. You're not sure. That's okay. But if a disabled person says, even I know that I'm non-binary, like in that case of the parent I encountered in the UK, you know, people will say, well, you don't really know that. We don't believe you. We don't trust you. And unfortunately, that can have 
very serious and damaging consequences, especially for the disabled people who are stuck living under guardianship, where yeah. even if you're an adult, your guardian can control your access to not just if you're seeking gender affirming care of any kind, but even if you want to spend your time socializing with other LGBTQ people or going to LGBTQ related events where your guardian or staff that provides services to you that your guardian is paying for can say, nope, you're under guardianship and your guardian doesn't want you to be involved with that. So you're not allowed and you can't stop it. Wow. Well, and I, I honestly, I don't think that these are things that or even remotely on people's radars when we have these conversations. Because I think, to your point, Lydia, um, the optic for so much of this is the most privileged in any every group. Um, and that automatically takes us out. Kaylee, anything that you want to add to that? Because I think this actually gets into my next question, which very much was about understanding this with an intersectional lens. Right. So um, Lydia brought up the term TERF. For those not aware, that is yeah. trans exclusionary radical feminist. Uh, these days, uh, these people might also refer to themselves as gender critical feminists. Mm. And it is a growing movement that is being funded by religious right organizations, including the Alliance Defending Freedom uh, and the Heritage Foundation, which are directly diametrically opposed to the work that groups like DFLAG are doing. Um, the Heritage Foundation and Alliance Defending Freedom want to take away the rights of all LGBT people, yet they will pay uh, women who... Uh, go up on stage and talk about how trans people are a threat to all women. And they talk about how uh, trans men, as in people who are assigned female at birth and transition to male, are confused young lesbians who are being forced to be straight men. And they'll talk about how trans women are uh, confused gay men or just sexual predators being, you know, deceiving people by pretending to be women. So. So um, I, I think for a few decades, uh, trans exclusionary radical feminism was more of a, a, a fringe ideology. But in the last um, several years, uh, especially, you know, at least 2015 or earlier, the uh, far right uh, extremists have found that it is convenient to funnel uh, tens of thousands of dollars, possibly millions. We're trying to trace the funding and we've, we've been able to trace some of the funding is also going to uh, other countries, including the UK from these US groups. Um, and where this ties into disability and neurodivergence is that TERFs, trans exclusionary radical feminists, are trying to push this uh, idea that, that young trans people are just confused, that we can't know our own identity and they'll use mental illness or autism to like be like, clearly these people don't know what they are. They're just autistic, you know, they can't possibly understand gender. And this harms LGBT rights and it also leads to deadly violence. I mean, so in uh, 2016, there um, was a transgender man, um, young man named Caden Clark and um, uh, police, uh, Basically, Caden Clark had been told by his therapists uh, and, you know, mental health and providers that he couldn't possibly tr be transgender and that he had to cure his autism before he could possibly know he was transgender. So he was denied transgender health care and he had um, mental health and trauma and suicidal ideation problems as a result, uh, which is very common, unfortunately. Uh, I, so... Police were called to his house, uh, theoretically on a suicide call uh, that he was threatening suicide, and they shot him dead. Um, it led to a huge outcry in the autistic and trans communities. Uh, Lydia and I were part of this outcry. We started the hashtag, um, what was it, autistic trans pride? Um, I'm yeah. trying to remember, yeah. Autistic, we started the hashtag autistic, autistic pride. Autistic Trans Pride yeah. in 2016 to mm -hmm. talk about how the intersection of these things needs to be recognized that you, you don't cure someone's autism before they figure out they're trans. Like these right. things are often interrelated and they're integral to who we are. Yeah, Autistic Trans Pride. I have a picture <laughs> of you on that flyer from 2016 Me that too. I helped you put together. Yeah. You might need um, to bring the hashtag back. Um, I think it's yeah. necessary. Yeah, so... <laughs> 
I mean, do hashtags really die? Do they? No, it it doesn't really die, but it hasn't been been used that much. But um, but it was it was a big deal um, that we launched this campaign because several organizations uh, put out a statement about the murder of Caden Clark and how it shows the intersection between transphobia and um, autistic people not being believed for their identity. So I just want to state a couple quick statistics before I move on to the next question, because I brought up uh, transgender mental health and suicide. And when I do that, I want to first point to resources. If you're transgender and experiencing suicidal ideation or in mental health crisis, the uh, Trevor Project offers a, a lifeline for LGBTQ youth. Trans Lifeline offers a suicide prevention crisis hotline for all trans people, um, regardless of age. And please do reach out for resources. So uh, Trevor Project did a resource uh, mental health survey in 2020, and it found that 40% of transgender people in the previous year had considered attempting suicide. And the National Center for Transgender Equality did a trans survey in 2015 that found that 43% of trans people had attempted suicide in their life. So this is a huge issue. Um, one other fact I'll just throw in there um, is that 85% of trans youth uh, are negatively affected by uh, news about attacks on trans yeah. rights. So the more we see in the news about trans rights being under attack by state legislators, by the governor of Texas, the more it's harming trans people's lives and it's increasing suicide risk. Um, the good news is we've seen time and time again that supportive communities, supportive families, yeah. accessing gender affirming care leads to uh, much improved mental health outcomes and much lower rates of suicide, much lower rates of uh, um trauma and, and uh, symptoms of depression um, that are, are harmful, so. Yeah, and I appreciate you mentioning those things because I think that part of the issue is that people don't know what is out there to support them. Um, and also that currently what is happening around us is having an immediate impact and the impact is pretty terrifying. I'm, I'm always mindful of our time and I wanna make sure that I get a really important question into you both, which is, um, you know, we are PFLAG, we are families, we are allies, as well as queer people themselves. Um, everybody is always looking for what they're supposed to do. I think that this article that we used this week was a perfect example of how many things um, still need to be addressed, um, how many people need to change their perspectives. And both of you have brought up so many points, several of which I had not considered, and I so appreciate you for that. Um, so when we are talking about people who are seeking to learn more in this space, to uh, practice behaviors that are more inclusive, where would you recommend that people start? Um, knowing that we wanna get them as quickly as we can to that direct resource um, and particularly resources that were created by people from the community. Um, and so um, Lydia, maybe I can start with you about wh what people should be reading. And I, I also love some of these start doing this and please stop doing this kind of behavioral suggestions if you can. Yeah, I mean, one thing to start doing is no matter where you are, no matter what kind of work you're doing, there are creators and advocates and activists from the queer and trans autistic and broader disabled community who are putting work out there to educate, to inform, and I hope to provoke and to agitate a little bit. So if you're on TikTok, if you're on Instagram, if you're on Twitter, if you are more of a go to the library and read a book person, or if you are wanting very much desperately to find some in-person opportunities to be somewhere, there are folks that are creating work and creating spaces for you in a format that works for you. And you know we don't have enough time to say, here's a comprehensive list. But one thing that I, I can tell you to do is if you're not sure about something, you can look it up or you can ask and that's okay. You know, a lot of times people will say they're afraid to ask questions because they don't want to be offensive or they're worried they'll say the wrong thing. And, um, you know, if you're coming from a respectful point of view, most people will understand the difference between someone asking a perhaps little bit ignorant, but respectful and genuinely yeah. earnest question and someone that is just trying to mock someone that is just trying to demean or to degrade. Like there is a really clear difference. 
And it is okay to ask questions. I would suggest, you know, don't ask a random stranger questions right? Like, don't do that. Like the one person at your school or office who you happen to know is transgender, please don't barrage that person with questions about what it's like to be transgender. But if you have a good relationship with someone who you know is neurodivergent and part of the LGBTQ community, it's okay to ask, can I ask you some questions? Is that okay? And let them tell you. And it's okay to ask if you don't have someone in your life that you have a relationship with, you can ask Google. And Google might give you some bad results, but if you spend a little bit of time looking up who are people and organizations doing work in this space, whether at AWN or at the Transgender Law Center, the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, people at Health Justice Commons or Sins Invalid, like all these different groups that are working in disability justice and trans justice spaces, that you can start to get a sense of who are the kinds of people we should be paying attention to and you will start to learn more. And it feels really good to be able to learn about communities that you may not be part of if that's not your community and that's not your experience right. and to know that you're doing so respectfully. And you know that will help you be able to think through what are practices in my life or in our work where we are able to shift our practices to perhaps create a more welcoming environment to be able to shut down bigotry and prejudice quickly, to be able to send the message that we actually value all people who are here because of who we are, not despite who we are. I love that. I love that. And thank you for the part about asking questions. I think that is a paralyzing thing for a lot of people. And I really appreciate you saying it. Um, Kaylee, it's up to you. Give us the look at this, read this, please stop doing this, yeah. please start doing this. So again, I'll point to the book, Sincerely, Your Autistic Child. Um, I have a YouTube channel, it's scrolling right now, youtube.com slash Kaylee Whalen. Um, and I provide resources and facts on um, talking points about transgender identity and autistic identity uh, and the intersections between them. Also, uh, for people who are of uh, Latine, Latin American heritage, I do videos about my own heritage and about autism in Latin American communities. Um, and uh, I would really advise um, just trying to uh, look at um, autistic and trans content creators. There's a lot I could list. I often feature them in my videos. Uh, one that I particularly like is Neurodivergent Rebel on YouTube, uh, who I have a good working relationship with. Um, and so when, unfortunately, on TikTok and YouTube, there's a lot of hatred, there's a lot of bigotry, it's important you lift up, and I, I'm not just saying this out of self-interest, but like share and like and comment and follow and, and give to people's Patreons or donation pages who are trans content creators and autistic content creators. Because being on trans YouTube um, and autistic YouTube, like we're overwhelmed by negativity. There's far more YouTube channels talking about trans people uh, in negative ways and talking about Leah Thomas and trans athletes in negative ways than there are positive ones. And I try to be positive. I was a roller derby athlete. So I talk about being a trans athlete. And um, again, so it, I'm at uh, youtube.com slash Kaylee Whalen. I do some writing for the Autistic Women Non-Binary Network. Uh, they have a blog. Um, I do some consulting for the National Center for Transgender Equality they're working to improve their racial justice and disability justice work. They're one of the many organizations I mentioned who is trying to be more inclusive and be more inclusive in their leadership. Um, so there's a, a lot of resources out there, but listen to trans people, find those content creators. While you can go to a friend, there's often uh, YouTubers and content creators who put hours, you know, years of their life into creating content to help you understand autistic and trans identity. Thank you so much. Um, and definitely check out, uh, we have the all the information scrolling on the screen. So make sure you are checking out 
um, those resources and the websites. And yes, amen to supporting the content creators and elevating the good ones. It's the best way to shut down the bad ones. Um, Kaylee, Lydia, thank you so much for everything that you are doing. Thank you for coming on here and speaking to us and giving us some keys to start doing our learning. Um, I hope that we will see you again um, because I think this conversation was not long enough. Um, and it needs to happen a lot more often. Yeah. Um, so thank you both so much. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye. Well, once again, we are a little bit over time. Um, so quick things that I need to remind you. Um, we mentioned a lot of great books today. Um, check out those resources. Those are really excellent publications, and they are great ways for you to continue learning and actually showing up as a better ally. Um, also, please remember, PFLAG is uh, leading with love, and the best way to start doing that is reading with love. So check out pflag.org uh, uh, slash read with love to learn more about that program and how you can be part of it. Um, every single week, we wrap up the exact same way. First of all, reminding you to get vaccinated and please don't shame people wearing masks. Um, and we tell you to run fast, laugh hard, and most of all, please be kind. We will be next back next week but, uh, between now and then. If you need any help, please visit pflag.org to locate your nearest chapter. I'll see you next week on Something to Talk About Live.